It's 2020, and human actions are affecting wildlife more than ever. All these forests were just cleared. I think some of the animals have been uh, displaced. Most of the ones that we have assessed were some sort of human-induced injuries. They were so skinny like this. Over the decades, Wildlife Reserve Singapore has been investing in animal conservation and protecting wildlife outside its compounds. He probably wouldn't have survived if there wasn't any intervention there. Good luck, buddy. You can do it. This morning, Acres Wildlife Rescue Service is responding to a call about a young python that's been found at the Marina Country Club. If you just go back maybe two years back in time, this surrounded by forested areas. So all these forests were just cleared. So I think some of the animals have been uh, displaced. Every month, Acres rescues about 40 pythons from urban spaces. Though they used to live in the forest, now they're slithering into Singapore's canals and drains. He's definitely not sniffing out. He can give a nasty bite actually, but he's pretty calm so far. As part of a joint effort to monitor the reticulated python population in Singapore, Kalai takes it to the zoo's hospital to be microchipped before it's released. PXY. Today morning we had another baby python from Marina Country Club. Like most modern zoos around the world, Wildlife Reserve Singapore provides treatment to wild animals. Thank you. Thank you. Inside the hospital, Dr. Charlene is preparing to microchip another adult python that has been brought in. She's one of 10 vets who treats animals in the zoo's collection, as well as local wildlife. Can you move the, the bed? So basically we're keeping the snake supported and uh, we're just restraining just enough for the snake to, to not get away. And then just scanning the snake for microchip. Okay, so if it's already microchipped, then we just note down uh, the number, the percentage that come back as recaptures. It seems quite consistent. So that's actually quite uh, encouraging to know that some of the older ones are still around. Despite a heavily urbanised landscape, Singapore is home to a rich biodiversity of over 40,000 wildlife species. But as developments like the Cross Island MRT line continue to shrink their habitats, wild animals are venturing into the garden city for food and finding themselves in danger. This is an oriental white eye. When he first came in, he was only about five grams. We had to feed him every one hour or so. The chick was found at a local coffee shop. A member of the public brought it to the Jurong Bird Park's avian hospital. To mother these babies, it takes a lot of patience. Sometimes they get very excited and the food might go into their lungs instead. The Bird Rescue Unit rehabilitates up to 700 orphaned, sick and injured birds every year, including this baby large-tailed nightjar. It was found alone without its parents within the Jurong Bird Park's compound. 
He was actually very cold and very weak and he probably wouldn't have survived if there wasn't any intervention. So they eat insects and they usually lie on the ground in the wild and jump up to get their food. So we try to um, encourage that by offering food from the top to stimulate that natural behaviour. As it's still a chick, Gabrina must hand feed the nightjar. But two minutes later, the nightjar still isn't eating. Gabrina has no choice but to start force feeding. Nightjars in particular are just so difficult to hen raise in captivity. It's just difficult for us to mimic how they feed in the wild. For now, Gabrina's priority is to help it gain weight. Nightjars are notoriously difficult to feed in captivity, but she's optimistic that the bird will learn to feed itself after it's released back into the wild. In the wild, they eat moths, crickets, a lot of flying insects, but they rarely eat it for us. I think I've only had one adult nightjar that ate for us while in captivity, and all the rest, we did have to force feed them. To help the nightjar reacclimate to the wild, Gabrina has prepared an outdoor aviary for it. We have put in the plants to mimic the wild more and also he can hide in there from predators or even when it rains, it, it's some shelter for him at least. The nightjar will stay outdoors during the day for the next two weeks, after which it will be released back into the wild. Kalai and his team have found yet another python, this time near a construction site. It is severely injured with part of its lower jaw missing. Kalai suspects the injury may have been caused by humans, and he's bringing it to the zoo's hospital for a thorough assessment. People need to know what to do when they see a wild animal. We need to understand and accept the fact that these animals will enter into our living space they're just trying to coexist. Good morning, Dr. Charlene. Hi, um, so, yesterday we got this python. Most of the ones that we have assessed were uh, some sort of human-induced injuries, road traffic accidents, or have been hit by people. Having lost its lower jaw, it, it probably has not been eating, and it, it was definitely suffering. So I think what we'll do is um, we'll go ahead and euthanize. So if an animal comes in a condition like this, I think that we have the responsibility to be ending the suffering. Over at the Jurong Bird Park, the keepers have decided to keep the Oriental white eye as it didn't learn the skills it needs to survive in the wild. Now, it has to learn to get along with its new friends in the aviary. It's been three months since the young oriental white eye was rescued from a local coffee shop. Having been separated from its parents, it's been hand-reared by hospital vets and is now a full-fledged adult. It cannot be introduced back into the group in the wild because it didn't develop the social skills that it needs. So we actually take the decision to absorb it. For the past three days, the Oriental White Eye has been getting to know its new home at the Jurong Bird Park and its new neighbours, but from a distance. 
what we are doing here is a soft introduction is to basically gauge the interest of the established birds in this aviary itself to see if there's any pre-aggression. Today, the soft introduction finally ends. But will it accept its new home? As you can see, the birds are all mingling with each other. The Oriental white-eye joins over 15,000 animals in Singapore's four wildlife parks. But while the aviary provides a safe haven for birds like it, critics like Peter say that even the best zoos can't replicate the freedom of wild habitats. And for years, they've been campaigning against keeping animals in captivity for human edutainment. Any animal we have with us, we always make an effort to match the natural habitat. So our tigers have a large water body where they can actually swim. They also have large land area to climb up if they want to. There are many places where we can actually hide food from them. So they need to use their sense of smell to go and look for the food. So we make up for not having 10 times the space with having enough engaging opportunities for them to actually be stimulated both mentally and physically. One of the ways the zoo is refining its approach to housing animals is to mix species in a single exhibit. The future is to have exhibits which are almost like a living showcase of what happens in the wild. We try to have almost like a mini ecosystem there, a mini piece of nature. So the primary goal is for the animals to have more social interaction, more social enrichment. With this in mind, the zoo introduced otters to the famous Orang Utan exhibit last year. Then they brought in two pileated gibbons from the Asson Zoo in France. But one of the zoo's young stars, Bornean Orang Utan Saloma, got a little too curious about her new neighbors. Today is Saloma's first time in the enclosure with the gibbon. For the first couple of minutes, she was like chasing the gibbon. Having them all together allows us to actually showcase how different species can coexist in the rainforest. They will interact, they can share feeding, they can share foraging, they can play together. This is much closer to what they would actually experience in the wild. This is Nua, the only Sri Lankan leopard living at the Singapore Zoo. There are fewer than a thousand of her kind left in the wild due to habitat loss and poaching. At nine years old, Nua is at her prime and the zoo wants to find her a mate as part of their conservation efforts to protect her endangered species. There are about 90 Sri Lankan leopards under human care and then all of them are individually profiled in the start book. The most important criteria that we're looking for is his genetic value, if he has any descendants. We need to have a diverse population under human care as a safeguard towards any catastrophic event that may happen to the leopards in the wild. I believe we found a perfect candidate for our female Nuwa. He's a male uh, named Raja from Ragunan Zoo, Jakarta, Indonesia. He has not reproduced at all and he's already nearing the end of his reproductive lifespan. When he dies, his entire gene bloodline will be, will be lost. Because of the global pandemic, Raja's travel to Singapore faced complications. His arrival was delayed by three months. Raja finally arrived at the Singapore Zoo in July. 
but at 14 years old, he's already nearing the end of his reproductive life. The zoo's vets have collected his seminal fluid in case artificial insemination is ever needed. We will always go for natural mating first. That's the easiest way. Raja has very good quality of semen under examination. And now we just hope he will know what to do when he's mixed with the female. A big male should be anywhere from 70, 75 kilograms. Raja is about 95 at present. Him being fat is going to affect how fit he's going to be when it comes to natural mating. And we'll put him on a training program to get him into the right condition. The keepers are helping Raja to get ready for his first date with Nuwa. Now they must wait and see if their efforts will pay off. Over the last decade, Wildlife Reserve Singapore has funded over 90 wildlife conservation projects like this one at the Thompson Nature Park. For four years, primatologist Andy Young has been fighting to save a local endangered species that most Singaporeans have never seen. This is what we're looking out for. It's called the Raffles Banded Langer. It is a monkey that is mostly black in colour, but it has white colour bands on the chest and also on the inside of the legs. They are critically endangered because we're talking about 67 in Singapore and probably about 200 or 250 in Malaysia. A hundred years ago, troops of banded langers were easily spotted all across Singapore, from Tampanese to Tuas. But the clearing of forests has forced the elusive tree-dwelling monkeys to retreat into the central catchment nature reserve. During our few observations, we will record what kind of food do they eat. So if they're eating fruits or leaves of a certain plant species, we can then work with uh, the National Parks Board to look at ways to perhaps restore the habitat with all these food plants. Mm, I think maybe we can set up here. It has a pretty good view. What do you think? Yeah? Okay. If the langers were to come down to the ground, they might be looking for food. So it's also a good indicator of whether this habitat is important. Over the last four years, Andy and her cameras have gathered invaluable information about the Raffles banded langers. We have documented 11 groups of langers and it consists of 67 individuals. And we have also identified about 60 species of plants that they eat, which range from flowers, fruits and leaves, where they need some artificial structures to help them cross safely from one forest patch to another. All this information will help us protect the last home of the Langers in Singapore. Today is going to be an exciting day for Raja because it's his first time entering the Leopard Happy Dead in Singapore Zoo. We're going to put some meat around. And then we're going to tie one small bone on the lock. I just want him to follow the meat trail. He took the time like a Raja and he came to the exhibit like a Raja. Raja is getting acquainted with the enclosure first, without Nuwa, 
the resident female leopard. These are solitary animals. You only can pair them. The female is on oesters. First thing he did is he starts sniffing. So he will be thinking that, oh, I can smell another leopard. That's why his movements are very slow. You can see him sand marking everywhere. Because he's like, OK, these are my areas now. The young large-tailed nightjar that was found at the Jurong Bird Park has regained its strength under Gabrina's care. It's now ready to return to the wild. So we'll be releasing this juvenile white nightjar over here uh, because it's close to where it was found. Good luck, buddy. You can do it. He looks happy and content, and there hasn't been any sightings of like predators around, so I think he will be fine. He's going to meet other night jars and um, make a family of his own, so we're helping the whole ecosystem thrive by just helping him for that few weeks. Across the island, Acres is also releasing five pythons into the forest. We don't want them going back to residential areas, even though they're very adapted to urban living. Uh, we should treat them properly, lah, because at the end of the day, they're wild animals, they're sentient beings. Back at the zoo, the keepers are letting both Raja and Nua into the enclosure. It's the first time the two solitary leopards are in the enclosure at the same time. She's ready to mate. But is he?